Hello and good evening, and uh, thank you for making the time to join me once again on hashtag John Mahama Live. Tonight, I want us to discuss the way forward for our country, Ghana, as the number of people contracting the novel coronavirus and the death toll from this pandemic increases. The impact of the pandemic on our business, on our lives, on households, and the effects on our, on our economy are all issues that we must discuss. At this point, I want to extend my sincerest condolences to all the bereaved and grieving families of those we have lost to COVID-19. It is difficult when the life of a loved one is cut short so prematurely. And I know that words are not enough to console you at this time. But please rest assured that we share in your grief. Our hearts particularly go out to the likes of 48-year-old Dr. Hari Ousubwating's family of the SD, Dr. Hari Ousubwating of the SDA Hospital at Kwa Daso. Our hearts go out to his family who died in the line of duty at the prime of his life. A mourning nation expresses its, its gratitude to you for the ultimate sacrifice that you have made in serving your country and your fellow citizens. We must also continue to pray for the speedy recovery of our compatriots who are currently undergoing treatment as a result of COVID. It is sad to note the increasing number of our frontline health workers who have tested positive for the virus. Today, disturbing reports are being received of health workers getting exposed, testing positive, and forced to go into self-isolation, quarantine, or treatment. This is happening at a time that isolation and treatment centers are reported to be full, and both health workers and other positive cases are being compelled to self-isolate at home. This is a sad reflection of the Akufuado's administration's chaotic handling of the COVID situation, lack of adequate protective gear several months after our COVID emergency was declared is a sad testament of the bungling inefficiency that has characterized the handling of this pandemic from the very beginning. A refusal to be guided by science and a parochial desire for political interest has led governments to ignore advice from well-meaning Ghanaians, including the Ghana Medical Association, GMA. Any perceived disagreement with government in its decision-making or published statements or information has been met with savage attacks by government and ruling party officials. This was the experience of renowned pathologist, Professor Ajiman Akosa, who dared to question the credibility of COVID statistics released by government. It is trite knowledge that you cannot do propaganda with a pandemic. Lining up Council of State members, chiefs, student groups to the seat of government to congratulate the president on his handling of the pandemic will not let the virus go away. The infections and deaths will ultimately expose you. I've been briefed by the NDC COVID technical team about how isolation and treatment centers are filling up, resulting in several patients being asked to go home and self-isolate. Some health professionals are also being redeployed from their original units to beef up management of COVID cases. And this is having an adverse effect on the provision of reliable and quality healthcare service to other patients coming in with other conditions. Admittedly, there's a lot of pressure on health workers and also on our health facilities. We're indeed not in normal times. Do you have a question to ask? Do you have any experiences you want to share, an advice or an idea? Let's get interactive. Use the hashtag, hashtag John Mahama Live and post or tweet your question, comment, idea or experience on Facebook, YouTube or Twitter. You can also email me at office at johnmahama.org. I appreciate most sincerely the time many of you, my cherished friends on social media, my brothers and sisters from across the country and the world have spent not only interacting but also sharing your ideas with me on a wide range of issues 
including COVID-19, which is threatening our very way of life. And thanks to my latest initiative, Let's Talk, I've also been interacting via Zoom with many of you who sent in messages with a topic you want to discuss with me. And I've enjoyed all the call-ups that I have had so far. Deborah Lai from Ablikuma West contacted me on behalf of her excited mother, Bright Bell, a health worker, Yao Loku is a private school teacher, Adam, with whom I had a, an interesting conversation about entrepreneurial finance, and a dozen others. The interactions were heartwarming and very informative. For example, Yao Loku, like many of his colleagues teaching in private schools across the country, is not receiving his salary in full, and he decried the inequity associated with the distribution of COVID-19 food relief in his area, the Kaswa area, during the lockdown. In my Zoom conversation with Yao, he said he did not benefit from the food relief because it was distributed on a partisan basis. It is this failure and inability to competently distribute the food relief and the attendant feedback from especially the vulnerable in society that led to the premature and inevitable lifting of the lockdown earlier than it should have been. Of course, many people were eager to resume normal life because of the economic impact of the lockdown and the government's failure to proportionally reach out to households in their affected locations. I wish to emphasize that the present situation we are grappling with could have been avoided if suggestions offered by well-meaning Ghanaians, including myself, were heeded by government. The Akufuado administration refused to listen to calls to include assembly members and traditional leaders in public education about the disease, in distribution of COVID relief items, and in contact tracing and surveillance. The result has been the disorderly and chaotic distribution of food that caused the lifting of the lockdown. Public education has also been abysmal, and understanding of the trans uh, transmission of the virus is low. Messages in our major local languages are very few or non-existent in many cases. This is reflected in the total absence of physical distancing in our public places such as our markets and transport terminals. Involvement of traditional rulers in guiding surveillance and contact tracing would have delivered positive outcomes because they know their communities well. The consequence of government's decisions born out of short-term political considerations instead of the signs of the pandemic has been the rising number of COVID-19 infections and the resultant deaths we are seeing today. From two confirmed cases on March 12, that rose quickly to 8,548 on 1st June. Today, 17 days later, we have 12,590 confirmed cases and 66 deaths. Reports that isolation and treatment centers are full make the situation all the more dire. While government keeps priding itself with success in testing and has attributed the high rate of infection to the increasing number of tests being conducted, many have expressed skepticism about the accuracy of government's COVID statistics and gone as far as accusing the authorities of massaging the figures. It is recommended by international health experts that as countries start to ease restrictions, it is necessary to expand testing in order to understand the trajectory of the virus. Unfortunately, a strange directive has popped up issued by the Central Regional Director of Medical Services, requesting all districts and facilities in the region to halt mass testing and test only in conditions when a patient comes in with suspected symptoms of the disease. This has been interpreted by many as an attempt by government to restrict testing in order to show a slower rate of infection. We all have to be we all have a part to play, all of us, towards ensuring that we protect ourselves and our family and our colleagues from infection. But it is the responsibility of government, more than any other, to ensure that our management of the COVID virus is transparent, is people-centered, 
and is based on the best scientific advice and practice. My brothers and sisters, health is a human right. The outbreak of coronavirus has shown that a strong healthcare system is vital for any country. The provision of modern, well-equipped health facilities with motivated staff will make it easier for you and every Ghanaian to access quality health care. The NDC party I lead has demonstrated over and over again that it does not talk, it delivers. We are guided by deeds and action and not talk. In our period in office, at all times during the Fourth Republic, we have delivered state-of-the-art regional hospitals, district hospitals, polyclinics, health centers, and CHIPS compounds. And evidence of our delivery abound all over the country. If given the opportunity again by the grace of God and the will of the Ghanaian people, we will continue our aggressive rollout of social infrastructure, making sure that every region has a modern regional hospital and each district has a modern hospital facility, depending on the demographic and population of its catchment area. I'll ensure that all our citizens have easy access to quality and efficient health care anywhere in our country. In my Let's Talk conversation with Bright Bell, and you can watch that on my Facebook page or on John Mahama TV on YouTube, he brought up the issue of the Onuado mobile vans that my administration introduced in 2015 and which currently have been left abandoned by the President Akufuado administration. These were vans deployed to provide medical outreach services including dental care, eye and ophthalmic care, mammography and general care in underserved and hard to reach areas of the country. As was noted by Bright, the vans have been left at the vagaries of the weather at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering Compound at Kolibu. We would rehabilitate and expand the fleet of mobile clinics and make them available in all our 16 regions so that we can take healthcare to the doorsteps of all our people, even in the remotest parts of our country. We will build a new Onipanya hospital ship and deploy it to provide medical services to the inaccessible riverine and fishing communities on the inland Volta waterways. Ladies and gentlemen, my attitude during this pandemic has been to support Ghanaians, including health workers, with whatever I could mobilize, and also to assist government with ideas and possible solutions born out of the technical advice offered by our team of experts and my own experience serving in government. This has been my motivation all through. That has motivated me, our party executives, parliamentarians and parliamentary aspirants and the NDC COVID-19 team to move around communities and educate the people, provide essential items to our health workers and also distribute relief food items to Ghanaians. We've also offered many useful suggestions for consideration by government. As the easing up of restrictions continue, it is the duty of government to protect health workers, students, lecturers, teachers, and the public at large. I commend all our health workers, doctors, nurses, field and laboratory assistants, support staff, including cleaners and orderlies who are all risking their lives to save Ghanaians from this pandemic. I invite you to take a moment to think about the doctors, nurses, and others whose samples are taken after exposure to patients who have tested positive for COVID-19. Think about what they go through together with their families while they wait in some instances for more than a week before they receive the results of their test. Just think about the anxiety alone. I believe we can serve our gallant health workers better than we're doing currently. They did not sign their death warrants when they swore their respective professional oaths to serve humanity. 
We need to inject efficiency in what we do. Government must take steps to curb the long waiting times, which in itself has contributed to the community spread of the virus, including spread at workplaces and among health workers. We we'll continue to hear reports of non-payment of promised allowances and incentives to health workers. It is difficult to understand the delay in such payments, considering that this was adequated, adequately budgeted for and provision was made in the money that was drawn down from the stabilization fund with the approval of parliament. And so it's not like the money is not available. The money was drawn from the stabilization fund approved by parliament and it's available for these payments to be made. We must motivate our health workers by paying them a dignifying and commensurate compensation for risking their lives so that you and I can live. I'm aware that adequate supply of PPEs to frontline workers remains a major challenge. And the question is, how does government expect them to work fearlessly if the protective gear, including face shields and other vital equipment, continue to be scarce commodities? There are reports of health professionals having to buy such protective gear out of their own pockets, their own income. And so how can a doctor or nurse examine a patient's face or throat in this era of COVID-19 when protective gear and face shields are not available? I call on government to expeditiously provide adequate and fit for purpose PPEs to health workers to facilitate healthcare delivery and to protect them from being infected. Similarly, the education sector deserves attention. I take note of the President's promise to distribute adequate PPEs and logistics to the schools as they are being compelled to reopen for limited academic work. But we've been here before, lofty promises which are never fulfilled. We cannot continue on a trajectory where we talk more than the action we take. Students on campus will need an adequate supply of water, multiple hand washing points, sanitizers, and prompt response from the COVID-19 teams in the various districts in case of any suspected um, uh, COVID uh, cases popping up. I pray government does not fail them and us, their parents. I wish our dear students well in their studies and their examinations, and I also urge you to take personal responsibility for your own health and safety. Our lecturers and teachers must also be in our prayers and on our minds. They are obviously going to be overly exposed to the virus. Government should therefore not renege on the assurances it has given them. I wish to reiterate my call for mass distribution of reusable masks to the general population, to food vendors and others who provide services on campus and live in the wider community. If they do not use appropriate masks, they will spread the infection on campus and in their communities. And we also need to begin to prepare now for the next academic year. That is more important in our educational scheme of things than the current overbearing desire to control and muzzle academic freedom in the few months left of Nanado's presidency. The public universities bill is totally unnecessary. And I agree with the Utah, Utah Ligon branch that it is unconstitutional and only intended for the president and for that matter the executive to control the public universities. The bill must be withdrawn from parliament immediately and the universities allow the space and time to prepare for the admission and management of first batch of free SHS students alongside the continuing students. Two weeks ago, I stepped out to the Isojaman district in the eastern region, where I visited New Pomu or Tosca fishing community. I listened carefully to their concerns, both in the community and doing an interaction with the fishermen on the lake. Beyond their pre-COVID-19 difficulties, which related to lack of pre-mixed fuel, 
unavailability of and high cost of outboard motors and the general excruciating socioeconomic hardships. They also lamented about the negative impact the pandemic has had on their lives. In all my interactions during my community engagement sessions and digital conversations, hardship and socioeconomic pain have been the worst recurring complaint. One cannot contest the genuine feelings of the citizenry, considering the reality that President Akofuado and the MPP did in raising the expectation of Ghanaians so high and have turned out to be abysmally disappointing in government. It is only when failure stares you in the face that you begin to make a distinction between vision and promise. Ghanaians understood perfectly well what promises were made to them in 2016. Today you can cherry pick about the definition between vision and promise as much as you like. Ghanaians will take into the polling booth what their understanding and perception of what they believe constituted, constitutes the level of fulfillment of your promises that you made to them uh, before the last election. As part of the alleviation of the effects of COVID on local businesses, I suggested a stimulus package to assist small and medium enterprises that had been affected already by the double whammy of government reneging on its contractual obli obligations to pay up on valid contracts entered into with indigenous Ghanaian suppliers and contractors, and also the poorly thought through and parochial financial sector clean out. All these have left many families and SMEs with their life savings and capital locked up in the closed banks. President Akufuado promised to refund the monies of all depositors in full, emphasis mine, in full. Unfortunately, it appears that like almost everything else promised by his administration, it was all words and not backed up by deeds. Depositors and investors are shocked to learn that they are only to, be, to receive a percentage of their deposits and have the rest placed in zero-rated five-year bonds. This is unacceptable. What will be the value of their investments in five years' time? If government paid up on these deposits and investments, there will be no need for the stimulus package we are applying now. We'll present a program for reinstating indigenous Ghanaian investment in the financial sector of our country. In the meantime, it is my hope that the disbursement of the stimulus package will be guided by transparency and not applied to vote buying in advance of the elections. I call on the members of our honorable parliament to call on the finance minister to present the implementation document of this stimulus package to Parliament for approval, as he had earlier promised. I support the call also made by the minority in Parliament for the Auditor General to audit the accounts of the money drawn from the Stabilization Fund and how it has been utilized. It was a most dishonest comment for a government official to suggest that a positive response from the Auditor General will suggest that he is a puppet of the opposition. My brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, our party has been in the vanguard of a fight to prevent the disenfranchisement of a wide swath of the citizens of this country. We recognize that our opponents are determined to suppress votes in areas of the country they deem not to be their strongholds. Otherwise, it is difficult to understand some of the restrictions being put in the way of a wider enfranchisement of all eligible Ghanaian voters. We await the verdict of the Supreme Court, and it is our hope that whatever verdict is given will be in the national interest to promote the wider participation of our citizens in our democratic process, rather than a restriction to an elite few. Following the easing of restrictions, I've requested our Functional Executive Committee to arrange a meeting of the Council of Elders and the National Executive Com Committee to finalize my constitutional obligation to consult these bodies 
on the choice of my running mate. We've also agreed on our 2020 campaign team and we'll announce this shortly. Our manifesto committee is also wrapping up its work and we expect to launch our 2020 manifesto in August. But even before the launch of the manifesto, I intend to begin a series of policy dialogues that will present to the Ghanaian public the main takeaways of our contract with the people of Ghana, if by the grace of God and the will of our people, we're given the opportunity to govern again. I wish to thank you for your attention and for joining us. And let me end it here and take your questions and your comments. Ready to roll. Good afternoon, my president. I'm an unemployed nurse, and I would like to draw your attention to the displeasure of many of us in the government in terms of appointment or employment. What plan do you have to absorb all qualified nurses right after their national uh, service? Uh, and the name is Evans Awute. Evans, thank you very much for your question. The plight of nurses who complete school has been a very vexed uh, issue that, I must admit, has plagued you know, several governments, including the current uh, government. The strategy of our government was to create more opportunities to employ more nurses by expanding the uh, facilities available for health care to our people. And so we will continue with that program of expanding the facilities for provision of health care so that we can post more nurses. But like I said before in one of my earlier Facebook Lives, I said that we're going to do a human resource gap analysis of how many more people we can accommodate in the public sector, especially in education and health, because these are the two major social sectors that we need to ensure that they have the appropriate and adequate human resources to be able to give a good outcome. And so we must have CHIPS compounds that have a full complement of a midwife, a physician assistant, and a nurse. We must have district hospitals that have their full complement of doctors, physician assistants, laboratory personnel, and all of them. And so when we do that human resource gap analysis, we will know what the gaps are and where, how many more people can be uh, pushed in and employed. And I'm sure that we'll be able to absorb as many. I think that we rather need more, not less, of teachers, especially um, uh, educational um, uh, workers and also health workers. And so um, we'll give a, a program on that when our manifesto is given. And we'll give you more details of what we intend to do. Your Excellency, what do you think the government is not doing right in containing the pandemic? What would have been your best approach in dealing with it. I think that one of the major omissions of government is that public awareness is not enough. People have the primary responsibility for protecting their health. And if people have the right information and knowledge, they will take steps to protect themselves. If you go to the markets and the rural place, uh, uh, areas, a lot of people don't understand the concept of social distancing or fiscal uh, distancing. A lot of people wear masks, face masks, that are reusable, and they don't, they've not been educated that you need to wash the reusable face mask and press it with a hot iron so that any COVID virus that has accumulated on the mask is killed. And so public education has been very poor, and as a result of that, I mean, people are just living their lives, and that is how come um, the virus is spreading some more. And I also said that the strategy of this government is to seek herd immunity. They had lost the battle to contain the virus, 
And so it was like, okay, let's open up, let's ease things, and let people go about their business. And if a lot of people get infected with the virus, the virus will have nowhere else to go, and um, it, will, it will disappear. And so they've been seeking herd immunity, and that's why the figures continue to go up. But what they don't realize is that it's been done in countries like Brazil, and if you go see the, kinds, the numbers of people who are getting infected and those who are dying, you know, it's not something that I think, I believe we should uh, copy. And so I think government has a lot of work to do. They should listen to the experts and the scientists instead of just seeking a narrow political interest. I know that a lot of the easing of restrictions and all that is to create a conducive environment so that the EC can go ahead with their new register and the NIA can continue with their uh, issuance of the Ghana cards. And of course, so that the ruling party, the MPP, can hold their Congress and elect their flag bearer and um, their other parliamentary candidates. My name is Kubanwa, I reside at Adenta. One thing I wish to, one thing I wish you take a critical look at when you come into office again in 2021 is the SNIT pension law. I was an employee in one of the reputable banks in the country. Somewhere around 2019, I lost my job. I contributed to the scheme for more than 15 years. I'm currently jobless, and I've spent all my savings on my family. My problem is that can the SNIT law be amended to cater for contributors who are not due for retirement but have lost their jobs through no fault of theirs? Kumawu, I think. Um, I, I, I feel very sad when I hear stories like this. And that is the reason I made you know, that suggestion that in this difficult period that most people are passing through, we must be able to give a portion of their SNIT contributions to them for a period so that it gives them enough time to be able to find uh, a new job. Unfortunately, um, SNIT came out and said uh, the law does not allow them to do that. Of course, I know the law does not allow you to do that. You need to send the law to Parliament to be amended in order that you can do that. I'm a, I've been a lawmaker of many years standing, and I knew that the law would have to be amended. And so when I suggested it, I was not saying that SNIT should do something illegal. And so I want to say that when I come into office by the grace of God, we will amend that law so that in times of adversity, a certain portion of people's contributions can be given back to them so that they can survive to find work and contribute again another day uh, to SNIT. Um, Mr. President, why don't you introduce distance learning on weekends for nurses with certificates to upgrade to diploma as it is done for teachers? This is because it is not all of them who apply for steady leave that will qualify. With this, they can still be in the house and study on weekends to obtain higher qualifications. This is from Dan Van Boating in Umpoho. Dan, thank you very much. I hope um, uh, everyone in Umpoho is doing well. The experience we've had in this COVID era show that we can use distance learning for a lot of things and that we must not, in all our educational um, um, uh, outcomes, uh, be based on situations where you have physical contact between teachers and students. COVID has taught us that we can use online methods to be able to uh, reach the students. The only time you need the physical presence of students and lecturers is when they have to take part in a competitive exam in order to move to the next stage. So it is possible, I agree with you. It's being done with teachers already. Many of the uh, uh, teacher training uh, universities are using distance learning to uh, certificate um, teachers. And so we can do the same for uh, nursing. And so that is a good suggestion and um, would we'll look at it. Please say, as a former assemblyman, if you are giving the opportunity again, what will you do to improve the conditions of assembly members and not just motorbikes? <laughs> and the name is Honorable Abubakari Abdullahi, assemblyman member, but you didn't tell me where you are an assemblyman for. But let me say that um, it is important. Assembly members are the bedrock of our local governance system. And so their conditions of service are, must be important to us. Um, I made a suggestion in the last um, uh, program that I took part in. That was the flag raising ceremony of the NDC 
on the 28th anniversary uh, of our party. And I said that if given the opportunity to be president again, we're going to involve the assemblymen in helping us solve the final you know, uh, riddle of how to get our births and deaths registration right. Because assembly members live in their electoral areas. They know every house within their electoral areas. They know when children are born and they know when people die. And so if we involve assembly members in birth and death registration and make them responsible for it, then every child that is born, they'll record the father's name, the mother's name, the date of birth, and all the other important information that we want, and they will transmit it to the, the database in the district assembly, which will also be linked up to the National Birth and Deaths Registry. So we'll capture in real time all children that are born. We'll capture in real time people who are dying, so that this thing about having a new voters register and all that will be a thing of the past, because we'll get in real time who have turned 18, we'll have uh, uh, who they are, and we can just transgress them, uh, uh, tran uh, transport them onto the electoral register. And for providing this service, our intention is to pay assembly members for it so that they can earn an income to be able to look after themselves. And so this is going to be contained in um, our uh, program on, on governance. And uh, when we talk about local government, I'll flesh this out in full and indicate what their responsibilities are going to be. From Hope Jose, in 2016 you said we need to be focusing on technical and vocational education. Is that still on the plate? It definitely is still on the plate. And if you remember, I announced not too long ago that we were going to make uh, technical and vocational education training entirely free. And so we're going to have technical and vocational education training centers in every district. And children who are good at technical and vocational education would rather go through that track, receive technical and vocational education. But at the same time, we will supplement it with lessons on English, maths, and science, so that it's not like they lose out in terms of these very important subjects. And so they'll do English, maths, and science while they do their dressmaking or their auto mechanics or any other uh, program that they are engaged in. And it will be absolutely free so that they can um, 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 take that track into technical school. They will either continue into technical um, institutes, and if they want to continue, they will continue into technical universities and uh, be able to uh, study for a degree um, and, and when they get into technical university. So we want to create a clear pathway so that those who want to pursue technical uh, and academic you know, uh, education, going through the secondary school route, uh, routes into the universities will also be able to do that. There are many parents who have come to me and said, look, we prefer, I prefer that my child goes and does technical vocational education because he's skillful with his hands and um, he will do better uh, in the technical education track than he will do uh, sending him to secondary school. And so we'll give parents that option and that choice and students that option and that choice to decide which track they intend to use. Uh, from Alasa Andrisu, please say, I want to know the status of the Savlugu sugar factory you promised and whether it's still a part of your plans for our beloved country. Um, we had a whole feasibility study done on the sugar uh, factory in Savlugu um, because we realized that um, it was an area where we could get sufficient arable land to be able to do commercial um, uh, 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 cultivation of sugarcane to feed the factory. And so those designs are there. The feasibility study is there. And so it was supposed to be the second of two sugar factories that we worked on. We finished the Commander one, uh, but we had not completely tied in the investment for the Savlugu one before we left office. Our intention is to produce more of what we can do locally. We have the same land as you'll find in Cuba or Brazil or wherever they have become major exporters of sugar. And so if we can produce a good percentage of the sugar that we consume, then it will save us uh, precious foreign exchange 
uh, in importing sugar from these other countries. And we, we, we are going to be, we're, we're able to do that. With the Commenda Sugar Factory, we built the factory, and the next stage was to go into the outgrower scheme to um, uh, grow the sugar cane. The Indian government had offered us $26 million for the sugar cane planting, and um, we were accessing that money when we left office. It's not been a priority of this government, and so they've refused to follow up in accessing the money to grow the sugar cane, and so the factory is standing uh, idle. I assure you when we come back, we're going to pursue the money to grow the sugar cane, and we will activate that factory and make sure that it cuts down the imports of sugar in this country. Um, what is your take on political manifestos as against long-term national development plans? I believe governance is a continuous process of a national development plan over the years. However, political parties craft manifestos that fulfill their political agenda rather than national development. Are you going to continue the projects that His Excellency Nanado started if voted into power? And this is Desmond Homenia from SCC Red Top. Desmond, fantastic question. And I think that um, this has been the bane of our progress and development as a country. Um, the fact that we have this kind of start, stop, start, stop, start, stop transitions has been one of the major problems that we have faced. Government start projects, a new government comes, it, believe, it doesn't believe in the vision that the previous government had, it comes out with its own vision, starts a new policy, another government comes, it abandons it, and starts its own. And so from economic recovery program to Ghana poverty reduction strategy, to uh, uh, Vision 2020, to uh, uh, 40-year development plan. I mean, these are all various development plans that have been discarded as soon as there's a change uh, of government. What we tried to do to stop this was to come up with a 40-year development plan. And we believe that with that overall framework, any government that came into power can take it and tweak it to suit their own ideological orientation. And so we did the 40-year development plan and said uh, it was done by NDPC, which is a state institution. And our intention was that any government that comes can take it and, you know, tweak it and then have a five-year rolling plan. Um, unfortunately, you don't hear much about the 40-year development plan. Now it's Ghana Beyond Aid, which has become a new policy document. And so um, I just want to assure the nation that we will take what is good in Ghana beyond aid, and we will consult and come to consensus on an overarching plan. And I can assure you that any projects that the Nana Kofuado government has started, and I've said this already, if I become president, I will continue. Because those projects are being built with the uh, taxpayers' money. And it's a waste if a new government comes and abandons them. And so if there are school projects, if there are health projects, if there are roads, I will continue them. And we will not renege on government contracts. We will pay contractors. These are business people. These are brothers and sisters and friends who sweat to get their capital to build their businesses. And government enters into a contract with them, build this road, or supply these equipment, or do this. And then a new government comes and says, because uh, you, you were awarded a contract by a previous government, we won't pay you. And that's the, the plight of many contractors. Several of them have died. You know, I know many contractors who have died waiting uh, for their money because a new government came in, and those administration, and they refused to pay them. And up to now, many of those contractors uh, are owed for uh, uh, contracts that they executed with government. Um, when you voted into office as the president of Ghana in December 2020, what are your plans to close the wide gap between Article 71 office holders and public sector workers in terms of salary? Abu Bakar Ayarga. Um, it was clear in our manifesto of 2016 that we will continue with the implementation of the uh, Constitutional uh, Review uh, Committee. And one of the major recommendations that was made by the Constitutional Review Committee was that we should come up with a public emoluments board that will uh, synchronize 
emoluments across the whole public sector so that you don't have this division of Article 71 uh, office holders and then also the rest of the public sector. And so we are committed to uh, synchronizing it and uh, doing the constitutional um, amendments that would allow uh, to have uh, unanim a, a, a unitary you know, uh, a system of emoluments across the public sector rather than the division into Article 71 and, and, and the other uh, groupings. Um, let's see what's next. Uh, my name is Cornelius and I have lived in Sakumano for the past 20 years. The Sherman underbridge has been a problem. Commuters suffer every day to go through the tunnel which links a Sherman. When it rains, saloon cars cannot drive through the tunnel, and the passage of cars, uh, passenger cars also find it very difficult passing through the tunnel. Apart from the rains, the traffic situation is also terrible. We shall be grateful if the tunnel is done like has been done in East Ligon. Um, we, had, we had planned two bridges over the motorway, and we started the first one. And so if you come to the Sprintex Road, where they call the Flower Pot Runabout um, at Palace Mall, you will see that we had erected the pillars. I cut the sword for it. And that was the first um, uh, bridge over the motorway into East Ligon. The second one was to cross the motorway to take you from Tema into uh, Ashaman. We believe that having a bridge across the motorway was an easier uh, commute over the motorway than under the tunnel. If you look at the tunnel, that has been built uh, between East Ligon coming onto the Spintex Road. It hasn't solved the bottleneck because there's still heavy traffic there. Because once you go out, out through the tunnel, you come to the road that comes from Accra Mall to Spintex, and there's a traffic light there. And so at peak times, there's very heavy traffic. But if we have an interchange over the motorway, it will give people various alternatives. So, so if you're coming from the new Bema Camp Road, Airport Hills, and you want to go to Tema, you take the side link and turn right and go onto the motorway and continue to Tema. If you want to go to East Ligon, you go over the bridge. There will be a curve, a, a turn where you turn to East Ligon. If you want to come back to uh, uh, Tetequashi Interchange, you can go around and come under and hit the motorway and come back to Tetequati Interchange. So an interchange gives, or a bridge, gives more alternatives than a tunnel. And so I would rather uh, pursue the building of a tunnel. And uh, by the grace of God and the will of the Ghanaian people, I become president again, will complete the bridge over the motorway into East Ligon and will build a bridge over the motorway from Tema into a shaman. Uh, dear GM, I'd like to know your position on Professor Kweku Asai becoming your running mate in the 2020 elections, given that you represent the many collective mobilization of knowledge and Asari also being ingrained in this philosophy, it might be a good moment to look beyond partisanship. You are both young and energetic. Uh, you, are, you are both a young and energetic couple that not only the younger generation of Ghana look up to, but also the reason behind what's happening around the world of, in terms of foreign policies. Uh, this is Fidelis Abagulum. Abagulum. Um, Fidelis, thank you for your question. Um, I've never met Professor Kweku Asari, but um, if there's one person I respect, it's him. Um, he's very knowledgeable in constitutional law, and um, I noticed that he speaks his mind objectively uh, without fear or favor. And um, he doesn't ex uh, exhibit partisanship in his interpretation of the law or his contribution to our political discourse. And so he's a wonderful person. Um, Ghana must be happy to have him as one of our citizens. I'm very, you know, uh, happy anytime I read his opinions and um, I respect his intellect. But um, I, don't, I don't know <laughs> if he wants to be a running mate. <laughs> And uh, I, don't, I don't know what party he belongs to. Uh, I don't know what his political orientation is. But um, it's not everybody who takes the plunge into politics. It can be a very uh, difficult uh, business. And not everybody wants to uh, get into uh, politics because of the hostile discourse and some of the uh, bullets that are thrown at each other. 
And so he's doing a good job for his country. He's working outside, but he always contributes his ideas to whatever discourse we're having in the country. And so I, I respect him, and I think that he should continue uh, what he's doing. But um, like I said, I'm waiting for our party to convene the Council of Elders and the National Executive Committee, because our constitution states that I must announce my running mate in consultation with these two bodies. Unfortunately, because of the restriction on mass gathering, uh, it, was it was not possible for us to bring the members of our National Executive Committee from all over the country to um, implement that consultation. And so uh, now that the way has been cleared, um, you'll be uh, hearing the name of my running mate soon. Uh, Benjamin Elia Ano, Mr. President, you said you bring back the Black Star Line when you were in office. Will you still continue after you resume office? I believe that there's a rule for investment in shipping. In the past, we had the Black Star Line, which was a state-run uh, shipping line. Unfortunately, like happens to all state-run institutions, um, um, it, it became a drain on the public uh, uh, financing. It was not being run profitably. And so eventually a decision was taken to uh, liquidate it. But I still believe that there is a place for a shipping line in Ghana. And this time it will not be government alone investing. Government must get strategic partners to join it uh, to be able to set up uh, a shipping industry. I mean, just imagine the imports and exports that come and go into our country. If we had a shipping line that employed Ghanaian seafarers, and all that. That will create employment opportunities for us, and it will also uh, uh, increase the vibrancy of the port city of Tema and uh, Takradi. And so it's something that I've not given up on. I'm still uh, looking at. Um, Enu Nana Kwame Evans from Kotobabi now. Mr. President, our country is already debt distressed. When elected to office, how are you going to better it for Ghanaians? Um, that is one of the major um, issues we've been pointing um, attention to. Um, if you look at the period um, from President Kofor's time, we got hippic relief. And as a result of that, um, um, some of our debts were forgiven. By the time President Kofor left office, he left a debt of 9 billion um, uh, Ghana cities, a public debt of 9 billion Ghana cities. Um, we took over. And uh, by the time we left uh, office, Professor Mills and myself, uh, the debt is stated as having been 122 uh, billion uh, CDs. Now, in the three and a half years of the Nanado administration, a party that in opposition had decried borrowing has added onto the national debt 137 billion CDs in three and a half years. And for me, I don't see anything to show for the money. At least in Prof's time and in my time, I mean, you see, you know, uh, infrastructural projects that we engaged in. And so you can see what the money has been, has been put to. And 137 billion in three and a half years, and there's nothing, virtually nothing to show for it except, you know, empty promises, empty talk. Um, I, I really feel concerned. What has happened is we have our fiscal space reduced. And so any new government that comes will have to deal with this very high debt burden. And you must understand that this is 137 billion Ghana cities over a rebased GDP. And it therefore means that we should have been able to bring our debt to GDP ratio much lower. But still, if you look at the World Bank category of countries with high debt distress, Ghana is on top when it comes to Africa. And um, it's going to create difficulties for any new government that comes. But um, we've done it before. And um, I've assembled a team that um, will, we, we are studying the situation. We are keeping abreast with everything this government is doing. And uh, I'm sure that we'll be able to make a quick turnaround uh, when we take over the reins of government by the grace of God. Um, from Ebenezer Kwesi Akins, President Mama, please, would you improve our basic educational system when elected? 
because I really want us to be competitive in the world. Everywhere in the world, the basic education is the most important, is the most crucial. And that is what should attract the most investment because that is the fundamental of education. If a child gets it wrong or does not get the proper uh, start from the basic level, then it makes it difficult for them to continue at other uh, levels of education. Unfortunately, um, currently, the biggest investment we are making in education is in the secondary sector because of the current free SHS. And investment in uh, basic education um, has declined or, uh, as a proportion of secondary education. Uh, we need to readjust our priorities and see how we can continue with the free SHS, but at the same time increase investment at the basic level so that we improve you know, learning of arithmetic, we improve learning of science at that level, we improve, improve learning of English and uh, other languages so that the children have a good um, uh, op uh, opportunity uh, in their educational outcomes. And so, yes, we'll put emphasis on basic education. We, in our previous administration, we removed more than 1,600 schools under trees and put new school infrastructure to create a better environment for children to be able to uh, learn. But it's not only the infrastructure that matters. It is the learning aids and it's also the teachers. I've been a rural MP before. You go to a school and you find only two teachers handling class one to class six. And um, how we can encourage more teachers to accept to serve in rural areas is something that uh, we need to look at. We discuss an incentive system where teachers who agree post for postings to the rural areas will receive a certain allowance, but it was never implemented. It's something we'll look at again so that we can encourage teachers who go to the rural areas to accept posting. We can give them um, a means of transport at subsidized costs, a motorcycle or something, so that they can ride to school uh, if they are living a distance from the school. I mean, there are many things that we can look at, and together with the teacher unions, we'll discuss this and see um, how to go about it. Um, from Togwe Chikata, where would you place the traditional rulers in your next government as far as decentralization is concerned? They've been relegated to the background for long. Good luck. Um, Togwe, the, before um, colonization and before um, Western uh, governments came, uh, the, our chiefs were um, the, the rulers of their various uh, areas. And they have a direct contact with their people. They stay with their people. And um, their people hold them in a lot of respect and reverence. And so you cannot have an effective decentralized system without the participation of chiefs. And that is why in the appointed members to the district assembly, not the elected, we involve the chiefs uh, and give them representation in the appointed uh, members. Unfortunately, that has been diluted in many cases, and I know our traditional leaders are not um, uh, enthused about it. And so it's something we'll correct when we come into office. We will make sure that uh, the chiefs uh, get uh, involved. As I uh, discussed about involving the assembly uh, members in birth and death registration, we can create an, a supervisory um, uh, uh, role for chiefs in this whole process so that we involve our chiefs also in improving our local uh, governance. And so it's been another exciting session and uh, I want to thank you for tuning in and contributing to tonight's edition of my digital conversation at hashtag John Mahama Live. There are useful lessons to be learned from the initial missteps which have led to an increasing death toll and COVID-19 cases that we are seeing. But we, we cannot despair and we must not give up. At this stage, we need community ownership of the fight against the virus. Leaders in the community, including our chiefs, assemblymen and women, have enormous social capital which we can leverage to prevent stigmatization and also identify contacts for tests to be made if needed. Also, beyond implementing COVID-19 crisis management measures, 
we need to plan for the future on three main fronts. How to uh, anticipate, prevent, and mitigate epidemiological crisis, how to improve the resilience of our economy, and how to revive our economy. Last but not the least, let us remember to place people above politics in all things, and let us continue to wash our hands with soap and the running water. We live in times where fundamental change happens virtually overnight, and so we need to be ready to reap all the benefits from these rapid changes. Ghana needs new jobs, new businesses, new ways of listening to one another, and indeed a new sense of pride. And I believe I'm here to deliver all these. Corruption should not have a future in our country. And I promise you a transparent administration. I promise to deliver all the tools you need to keep government in check when it comes to transparency and integrity. Together, we can fight and end corruption in Ghana. Let us develop with integrity. This is my mission. This is my pledge to you. Stay safe and stay home unless it is unavoidable. Sunday is Father's Day, and I wish to say Happy Father's Day to all fathers across the country, especially the fathers who continue to leave their families to help fight COVID as frontline health workers. We thank you and we celebrate you. Let me thank all of you who joined us tonight, and especially those who sent in their questions, very interesting questions, and I've enjoyed my time with you. Have a good night, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you.